So the, this part of uh, the hands-on tutorial is indeed about periodic systems. So I wanted to yeah, basically begin with some overview about uh, crystalline structures and how to handle them in the Amsterdam modeling suit. Uh, so first and foremost, we indeed start up the GUI. And yeah, so one of the big advantages of the Amsterdam modeling suit is that there is a yeah, basically seamless handling between molecular and periodic structures of all dimensionalities. So one can treat uh, molecules just the same way as nanowires, as uh, uh, monolayer 2D materials, or then as 2D periodic, 3D periodic structures. Um, of course, uh, for doing so, this depends on the program you are using. So indeed, it needs a uh, program which is able to handle periodic systems that is not ADF, but it is, for example, BAND, which is our um, yeah, 3D or periodic DFT program. This is a real space code, meaning that it uh, indeed can handle all different kinds of periodicities on equal footing, which is, for example, not possible in plane wave code. Um, as an example, we have a uh, Amsterdam modeling suit also comes with the plane wave code, namely quantum espresso. There's also an interface uh, for WASP, so these two are generally a little bit more efficient. However, they are not able to treat a proper 2 or 1D periodic system. Um, so having said that, uh, first and foremost, how do we treat periodic systems in the graphical user interface? Um, as soon as I switch to a uh, code like band, I, uh, there is another option field emerging here, which indeed lets me set the periodicity. So there can be none, there can be chain, slab, and bulk. And then I can, for example, yeah, load in some crystals or construct them. There is some template library for various different common crystalline structures. I can pick one. Then there will some window will open and uh, it's already pre-filled with some default values. And I can then just uh, yeah, load this back in. So this is then the minimal part of the unit cell I'm seeing here. Uh, one can then click on this button here, uh, which enables one then to, yeah, which basically shows then the periodic images around the actual unit cell one is uh, dealing as model with. And uh, so yeah, in this way one can basically then uh, say start and manipulate the system, um, yeah, shift atoms around and do various things. Um, there is then under, yeah, commonly under edit, there is a separate field regarding crystals. It includes again this aforementioned uh, structure library. There is a constructor from uh, the symmetry space group and then there are various different tools. Uh, so for example, to generate slab models, to generate supercells, um, yeah, to map atoms uh, into different conventions for unit cells and all things like that. Um, so yeah, apart from that, uh, of course, one can, um, yeah, you can build your own model, of course, from scratch. So for that, uh, let's say you can, uh, for example, set the different lattice vectors, either in terms of vector lengths and uh, angles between them or explicitly as vectors as shown here. And um, so I see there is a question. So, okay. And um, yeah, so that, that's a way basically to construct a periodic system from scratch. Um, Another way, of course, and this will be the most common one, is uh, yeah, you get some starting structure from, say, a database or from external source from a previous calculation. And so, yeah, within the Amsterdam modeling suit, uh, let me delete this example here. Uh, yeah, you can basically import coordinates, meaning structure files, uh, just by this uh, file and import coordinate options. Uh, alternatively, there are also ways to indeed yeah, download it from some crystallography database or websites and uh, our graphical user interface also supports the import of ZIF files. And yeah, indeed, that's what we're going to start with. So uh, let me introduce you to the first example. Um, this is a 
palladium disulfide crystal. Um, so I wasn't able to find this system in any database, so I assume it doesn't really exist. However, the uh, 2D, 2D yeah, slab model or the layer, layered material exists, and that's also what we're going to deal with. Uh, before we do that, let me just show you how to yeah, uh, generate a 2D periodic model from a crystalline model. So uh, you can find this file uh, as part of the download package, and then you just go under yeah, in file import coordinates and then just pick the uh, palladium disulfide SIF file. Um, so this is this, and uh, yeah, again, we take a look at the actual crystalline structure. And as you can see, this is a layered material, so similar to graphite. And um, so as we will shall see in this uh, tutorial, this material has some interesting properties. So basically, we now have loaded in yeah, the crystal structure and um, yeah, the first thing we can, for example, we okay, can, we don't have to, uh, is to, yeah, map those atoms back into the first unit cell. So I assume here they already were, uh, in case one ends up with a system like this, where this is completely placed outside. I can um, just reiterate this feature and it will basically push the atoms back into the original unit cell. Um, so the next uh, task is then to yeah, isolate these individual layers. So what we're going to deal with is um, we have two different systems and we're going to look at their band structures. The first one is a uh, yeah, monolayer or bilayer material. The second one is the monolayer. And so yeah, in order to do this, we can again use our so first, let's focus on the original unit cell. Um, and then we can enable here the generator for slab models. Um, that allows it to specify the uh, Miller indices of the cutting plane. And uh, this cutting plane can be then op offset by selecting an atom, uh, as I have done here. Um, so it shows a plane, but as far as I can see, that's uh, an incorrect one. So please ignore that one. And uh, then I can click on generate slab. Uh, note that I have set here, pull it up again. Um, I can only slice 3D periodic systems, so let me repeat that. Um, so as you can see here, it also, uh, there's also an option to set a specific numbers of layer. Uh, so meaning to say how often is the original unit cell before it is turned into a 2D periodic system, how often is it repeated uh, yeah, in the axis or along this uh, vector specified by the Miller indices. Um, so we're gonna do this again. We pick this single atom here and we're gonna generate a, a bilayer material. Maybe I should also... Um, Increase this so this, this becomes more visible. Um, sorry for that. Um, so, yeah, for now we um, can then basically just save this file as a um, B layer, give it a name, palladium as to us. layer and save that. Um, so yeah, it will complain. We will set the options later. Uh, for now, I just want to show you the generation of the models. Um, before we come to that, um, I'd like to ask, are there any questions? Um, we agreed before, so whenever you have something which is not working or some open questions, uh, just raise your hands in uh, the chat tool and either Ole or me directly will try to uh, yeah, entertain your questions.
Still fine? Okay. Um, so, yeah, now we have basically stored this file. And uh, the second thing we're gonna do is we just, uh, yeah, we can basically just revert what we previously have done. Um, no, we didn't save this input file now, so we are back at our three-dimensional structure. And we just repeat the same procedure for uh, the generation of the monolayer. So we basically pick our atom, these million indices are fine, and we set number of layers equal to one in order to generate the monolayer. So now, as you can see, uh, this turned into a 2D periodic system. Uh, this looks like something might just for convenience map the atoms back to the original unit cell, which I just did. And again, so we then uh, save this file and uh, save us and we name it monolayer. Again, it complements, uh, I will address that later. So basically what we have done now is we essentially stored two structures and um, Uh, so there was a question, how do I, uh, how to do particular atom or delete a particular atom in the periodic slab? I can show you this. Um, so there's essentially no difference uh, to a molecular model. What you can do is um, you select the atom, say you want to change, change the element type, and uh, then you right click once it is selected and uh, then you pick the option change atom type. Then there will be a periodic table popping up and uh, yeah, you can give it say in our case, you can turn that into a uh, palladium atom. Uh, there will be a warning here because this is all already an existing structure. So it doesn't adjust for any bond lengths or so, which is fine in our case and um, yeah, it will also explain that. So, and then, yeah, that's basically a, uh, yeah, doping or changing of atoms. Uh, alternatively, you can also, um, yeah, just uh, pick one of these uh, editing tools and then let's say this allows you then to place an atom uh, somewhere in the unit cell you can then uh, say adjust its position by say, pressing control and one, control one, two, and three to you know, get different perspectives, look at it in X, Y, and Z direction. And that's, um, let's say, if you pick this and then you can uh, drag it with uh, while holding the right mouse button down, that allows you to yeah, shift this atom in your viewing plane and then if you yeah, basically repeat that for the different viewing plans, you can basically manipulate your system that way. Um, alternatively, what you can do, so yeah, the question was also about deleting. Um, yeah, deleting is pretty much uh, the same. So you can, uh, let me see, is there an option here? Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, so here there is uh, delete atoms or even easier once this is marked, you just hit the delete key and it will also disappear. Um, just to revert those steps. So alternatively, what you can also do is um, eventually in some cases change the bond links. However, I think it doesn't let one do this now because it's, it's this connected. is already a fully connected structure indeed. Um, so, um, yeah, hoping that this answers your question. Um, let me come back at our original um, model. Um, so yeah, no. Mistyped the file name I just saw, but that's actually not a big deal. Um, so next, what we are gonna do now that we saved the structure, um, indeed, I'm gonna walk you through the settings uh, which are needed to um, but perform a reasonable um, calculation for band structures while still uh, 
we are retaining some efficiency, obviously, um, these periodic uh, DFT calculations, they can be quite expensive, especially if the, well, dealing with the real space code, however, they are using uh, 2D periodic systems only and uh, a slightly minimalistic uh, description and set of options, uh, we should be able to uh, tune the calculation time down to a reasonable level for the sake of this uh, hands-on session. So uh, what we're gonna start with is um, obviously this structure is already uh, sort of optimized. So for the present moment, we do not need to re-optimize anything. So what we're gonna do is there is another calculation. Um, yes, I will come to that, uh, how to calculate the density of states. I will show you in a second. Um, so uh, yeah, so we pick a single point as option here. There are alternative ways uh, as Feder was already talking about in the morning. Um, you can do geometry optimizations, transition states, and uh, basically all the options uh, which are uh, possible for molecular systems can usually be done for periodic systems as well. Um, this is especially the case since we uh, converted uh, almost everything in our software stack to uh, the AMS environment, and that basically gives them easier access to that. So uh, we move on. Obviously, the periodicity uh, stays as a slab, so 2D periodic system. And next, we have to yeah, select our density functional description. Um, so for the present purpose, I just picked the PBE functional because it's reasonably uh, universal and still delivers a reasonably good description. And uh, so yeah, we saw already the warning a couple of times. Indeed, uh, this system includes heavy atoms, uh, especially the palladium atom. And for that, a scalar relativistic uh, description is uh, well, at least advisable. Um, as we are gonna look at the band structure and thus also at uh, unoccupied orbitals or crystal orbitals. Um, we are using a slightly bigger basis set. So in that case, you, uh, I limited that to the DZP the basis sets. Uh, as we were mentioning before, these are again, slated type like orbitals. So uh, technically they are handled numerically in band. However, they are designed to always uh, resemble uh, the orbitals used in ADF. And those are slater type functions. Uh, accordingly, the basis set notation here is uh, the same. And uh, yeah, we're gonna pick the double zeta p basis set. Uh, so then we use a uh, yeah, large frozen core, which uh, basically assumes the role of a pseudo potential um, in a certain sense. Uh, however, this is uh, yeah, really consists of actual orbitals uh, whose coefficients are not uh, changing during the SCF iteration. And uh, for now, we're gonna uh, select the numerical quality normal. I will come to that, what that exactly is in a moment. Um, so then we have two options here. We select both of them. Uh, the first one is to calculate the density of states uh, that should answer Phoebe's question. So this is basically as easy as that. You just have to tick this box here. Um, it will perform the calculation of the DOS at uh, after the SCF iteration is concluded. And uh, yeah, we also take the selection of the band structure. So then we um, basically select go to further options for the band structure. And what we're doing here is then we uh, show you this on the next slide. Uh, so this should um, uh, so basically for periodic structure calculations, one needs a case space and a sampling of the Brillouin zone. And uh, for performing the band structure calculations, this sampling is even increased along the paths uh, on which this sampling is performed. Uh, so we select here 0.03 reciprocal bores. And then we, for the sake of performance, we uh, limit the energy range in which we are evaluating the bands. Uh, that ranges from uh, 20 electron volts above the Fermi level down to 15 electron volts below. So with this, um, we are then basically ready. 
Um, I just uh, yeah save this example again. So uh, file and save, and then we can go and file and run, uh, which will uh, yeah make the ADF jobs window pop up and uh, it directly starts the calculation. As you can see here, we can monitor uh, what's going on by clicking on the log file here. And while the calculation is running, we can already prepare our second example here. Um, for doing that, let me come back to this uh, yeah, palladium mono layer. And what I'm gonna do is I want obviously to keep the same settings. So what I'm going to do is just import coordinates and I import the, let me first delete my atoms here and then I do file import coordinates and I load back in the monolayer model. And then uh, obviously we have to pay attention to give it the right name. We will store it again under uh, palladium disulfide bilayer and uh, we confirm that we want to replace this file. Um, so now basically we retain, that's a quick way to yeah, change out, swap out your structure and still retain the same options. Um, we store this file uh, by file save and we basically queue it in uh, for running. So after the first job uh, is concluded, the second one will start immediately and uh, yeah, we can uh, then afterwards, take a look at the results. Um, so we are going to wait for this calculation. Um, we open the log file. So um, as you can see here, it will indeed perform an SCF calculation, which is converging rather rapidly. As you can see here, this error uh, converges down quite nicely to the 10 to the minus six, which corresponds to the convergency threshold. Um, and then afterwards, so it also uh, yeah, lists the, the K points. So the K points as I said are the sampling points in the reciprocal uh, lattice of the crystalline material. And uh, this is what we basically selected to uh, evaluate the band structure. Mm -hmm. So as you can see here, this involves a much larger number of individual K points. However, they turn out to be evaluated rather quickly. We should almost uh, be done with this example here. So yeah, there's a little bit of waiting time involved. Um, while we are waiting for this, um, let me also come back. So this job has finished now. Let me just explain uh, very quickly. I was mentioning this before. There's this um, option in the main tab here, numerical quality. And uh, the settings we put here is basically, so this normal setting, this is just an, um, yeah, umbrella term for a lot of different numerical parameters. Uh, what is relevant for our case, for example, would be the case space here. So again, this is also um, yeah hidden behind some uh, predefined values. However, it's always possible uh, to set your own one, and uh, you can set here different integration grids. So regular symmetric you can also set manually. Uh, the number of k points in each direction, uh, yeah, to be used for this uh, periodic electronic structure calculation. So um, we take a look back at our second example that is already in and running. Um, this will run slightly slower than uh, our first example because, uh, yeah, basically the number of atoms. Uh, is doubled in this bio-layer model. But while we're at that, um, we can already take a look at uh, our preliminary result, our first result. 
And for doing that, we basically, um, just in the ADF jobs manager here, we select the first example here, and then uh, we click on the SCM logo here and we select band structure. So this will open another graphical user interface tool and it will load in the band structure calculated for this monolayer system. So um, slightly enlarge this, what are we seeing here? Um, this is slightly zoomed out, but uh, if you zoom in here on the very left side, what are you seeing is uh, the Brillouin zone, so the reciprocal lattice. And uh, so I have a 2D periodic system, so that's why this is only a, uh, yeah, an area instead of a volume. And uh, what these symbols show here are is, is basically the sampling path, uh, which is used to generate or project the band structure onto. Um, this you can see also here, so this can be changed interactively. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is then used to generate indeed the band structure. Alternatively, there are also things possible here that one uh, can switch to the actual real space view. So then you can see the actual atoms and then uh, say you can do things like selecting one and uh, then say pick bands or the density of states of those individual atoms here. And uh, so what you should see now is yeah, the F atoms of that uh, palladium atom. Um, of course, you don't see very much in that case. Um, but let's say if we look at the DDoS of the palladium, then oh, that's still the total one. Um, so I should be able to indeed. Um, no, this is the way how I do it. So, this shows me the palladium contribution of the palladium D bands in that case. Um, and yeah, similar DOS analysis can be done for the, the rest of the atoms and for all different uh, shells then, of course, as well. Um, so there is that. Um, let me clear up this view again. Um, Just turn back to the cumulative DOS um, the bands. I can then also, yeah, so there's another feature in here, as you may have noticed, indeed, the uh, band structure here has different colors, and uh, that is a result of uh, that we basically implicitly uh, we calculated also the so called fat bands, which are um, which take into account the contributions from individual orbitals. And so what are we seeing here? There are different colors. And uh, so whenever say in that case, some, some band turns red, that means uh, that indicates that this band has a dominant S character in this relevant parts of the Berlin zone. Uh, so, and then uh, blue corresponds to P orbitals and green to D orbitals. So, um, then let's actually look at our system. Uh, by the way, one can uh, zoom in this band structure uh, picture. One can zoom, I think, horizontally. Yeah? So you just put your mouse uh, underneath on the horizontal axis, and so with the mouse wheel, you can then zoom in and out. Accordingly, also for the vertical part, uh, the energy axis, you can also zoom in and out. So, and as you can see here, in this case, um, yeah, looking at the band structure, you will find you will find that uh, yeah, Fermi level indeed Fermi level is this uh, gray line here. Thank you very much. Um, and you can see that uh, yeah, there is indeed a slight band gap. Uh, you can hover over here, so it will uh, give you an exact number of the. Yeah, horizontal and vertical coordinates. So the second number is the energy value of uh, that band at that location in the reciprocal space. So we have a um, yeah, occupied band below the Fermi level, which uh, is around at an energy of 5.56 electron volts, negative electron volts. And uh, the lowest unoccupied band um, 
and crystal orbital has a um, yeah energy of minus uh, 5.3. So there is a difference of uh, yeah roughly what is that uh, 26 0.26 electron volts. So not very much. Um, that basically makes it uh, a semiconductor and um, yeah. So this is basically. Mm -hmm. Comments. Um, mm, um, I'm not sure what you mean. Yes, it it, uh, it depends on what you take as reference. The uh, Fermi level to be at zero electron volts. I think that is a matter of definition. Um, so in the way it is calculated here, it is calculated, if I'm not mistaken, with respect to some. Um, isolated atoms and their solution. And uh, so the energies you get out of that are basically, um, yeah, what you see here. Uh, however, it's true, you can um, reset that. And for some applications, this might be uh, more handy. Uh, however, in the definition of how band works on a technical level, um, you will see this, uh, yeah, Fermi energy at some uh, usually negative energy value. Um, but yeah, that is uh, indeed whether you uh, think of your energies as with respect to the Fermi level, then it is of course at zero. Um, and uh, or you pick some other reference as it's the case here and then you will get a different value. Um, the second question here is, uh, yeah, band calculation with hybrid functionals, uh, they are done in a very similar way. Yeah, you just select a different functional, and uh, but otherwise, no, the k points are always the same. So the k points is always uh, something where you um, uh, evaluate, yeah, some some crystal orbitals uh, in a certain with a certain k vector, basically. That's how it works. So there, um, this is uh, at least in the case of bands. Um, the band get option selection. Um, so maybe you can show in the log file. There should also be a short and small band. Um, on the band gap in the log file, yeah. So there is a band gap. Uh, here in the log file, but I think um, the question was about something slightly different. So the, um, could you please repeat the band gap option selection? So I assume uh, you mean the selection to calculate the band structure. Um, the band structure can be calculated by um, ticking this box here, so in the main uh, settings panel. And what I did then um, is uh, I clicked on this arrow here, so this always means further option on the very right of this calculate band structure option. And what I then did was just uh, increase uh, or refine the, the interval values. Uh, that's basically the interval after which uh, the uh, the bands are evaluated along this sampling path, uh, which is then laid out here. Um, I'm, I hope that answers your question. Otherwise, uh, let me know uh, uh, what exactly you mean. Good, then um, let's take a look back at uh, our second calculation. Um, again, we uh, have a certain number of K points to evaluate afterwards in order to uh, obtain a density of states and to sample that properly. Um, so I guess we have to wait for time a little bit more, but we should be almost at the end. Um,
And so yeah, you can monitor, of course, your progress, but as you see, this is indeed the last step and we are done. Um, so again, we repeat, we come back to the ADF jobs manager. Um, we now select the uh, B layer job and repeat the same thing. We open the corresponding uh, band structure module for this system as well, with by clicking on the SCM symbol and selecting band structure. So again, we get uh, yeah pretty much the same thing: our reciprocal unit cell, our real space system here, and our fat bands or colored band structure plus the density of states uh, projections on the right side. And let me slightly enlarge that first. So. Again, comparing the two now, um, what we are seeing here is that there is indeed a tiny little difference uh, caused from when going from a mono to a B layer. Indeed, we see now that there is some uh, uh, slight little bit of um, formally occupied or fully occupied band now reaching over the or across the Fermi level and uh, there is some sort of yeah, band, uh, unoccupied band, which almost reaches down to the Fermi level now. Um, so this allows one to deduce that the, this B layer system uh, should be more conducting. Indeed, if we come back at the uh, log file here, we also can see that there's yeah essentially no real band gap here. At least it is uh, significantly smaller than what we had here before. I'm not sure how this is exactly evaluated, but uh, the fact that we see something different here is probably because we used a finer grid to evaluate our band structure here. Um, so you can see this is actually a good example where the sampling of the case space does indeed matter. Uh, so probably if we had to have picked uh, more case space, uh, more K points here, we would also see that this number goes down to zero. Um, so indeed, this means now that this system is essentially, at least to some extent, conducting, while uh, the monolayer is more like a semiconductor. Indeed, and uh, this was this example was taken from a previous study. I included the citation here. Uh, where indeed these researchers argued that um, this material would allow one to realize a, um, yeah, basically a uh, yeah, logical junction on uh, electronic element out of a single material just by having a, um, yeah, two electrical contacts made out of a B layer or multi layer. And then, uh, yeah, the electrical junction is indeed. Uh, than a component consisting of a palladium dulcified monolayer. So, uh, yeah, this concludes my first example. Um, if there are any questions, uh, I hope you were able to follow the calculation. Uh, depending on the machine you're running this on, this may take, of course, a slightly bit longer. Um, however, I think this is still a small enough example for the present purpose. So, um, yeah, if you, if there are no questions at the moment, um, I would just quickly move on to the next example, um, just to finish uh, that one in time. So what we're gonna do now is um, we move away from electronic structure programs and indeed look at force fields, uh, more specifically on ReXFF. Uh, so I have been asked uh, in the morning um, so just to talk a little bit about this, so just uh, give you some quick overview. Um, so as we discussed before, as Fedor mentioned in the morning, uh, we feature various different programs in the Amsterdam modeling suit and REX is one of them. Um, it is basically a heavily parameterized empirical force field, which uh, has the property or the main benefit that it can uh, allows for the formation and uh, dissociation of chemical bonds. Um, so basically it describes a proper, yeah, chemical bonding phenomena in terms of a highly, uh, is this a, uh, highly efficient force field. Yes. Um, how is the charge density determined? Um, the charge density is determined um, by, let me just um, 
sure if this is possible right now. But what we can in principle do is uh, we click on the ADF uh, on the SCM logo here, we select view, and then uh, we can select various different fields. So I uh, hope this is now, doesn't take all too long, but just let me show this quickly. So what you do is now you, you can, this is a tool which allows you to uh, plot 3D uh, data in general for molecules and periodic systems. So um, what I need to do here is I need to add a field. So I go on fields here in the upper corner and uh, pick say calculate it. Then this uh, adds a bar at the bottom of this uh, window and I can then select a tool and I can then say, for example, uh, select various different properties. I can plot orbitals, I can uh, plot densities indeed, and various different other uh, yeah, spatially distributed results. So I can then put the uh, total density. This will take a little bit, it will calculate that. Um, and I Oh no, sorry, I did that wrong, let me delete that. So what you actually have to do is um, you go at isosurface, um, that adds another field and this allows me then to uh, calculate the total density and what you can get basically is at a uh, certain uh, iso value shown here. So if I make this smaller, it will become uh, larger the density or this uh, electron density lobes if I make it uh, larger, they will become, of course, smaller. Um, so yeah, if we pick something in between here, yeah, you get an idea of the density of states. And uh, note that there are various different uh, plotting options and things of that. Uh, so if you're, that's how you show it. Um, the charge density is, of course, determined as uh, the square of the orbitals and, uh, yeah, that will, uh, of course, also be subject to a uh, case-based sampling in that case. Uh, so the summation goes over all points in the case space. And, uh, the orbitals are basically the electronic structure is uh, squared, the state of determinants at these respective K points. And that's how you uh, get the weighted terms of the electron density. Um, so yeah, let me conclude this. Uh, let me close all these previously opened windows. Um, and then um, let me move on to our second example here. So what we're gonna do, and just let me show how to quickly set this up and then we can start uh, running this. And while, I, while it's running, I'm not sure if we are able to uh, complete that in due time. Uh, however, I will show you how the result is gonna look like and you can, uh, basically uh, uh, do this on your own. So this is a tutorial which is based on yeah, two different existing tutorials on our, on our website, which deal with mechanical properties of polymers. For the present purpose, we will use uh, yeah, basically a toy system. And that is uh, in this case, the uh, cis polyacetylene, the chain shown here. Um, we will use a sufficiently large uh, 3D periodic model and uh, for Reacts to handle that appropriately. Um, so what we can do is we open uh, a new input window as shown here. And uh, we can either load a structure in here. Let me do that first because um, I said, I'd like to get this example running as quick as possible. So what we have here is basically a decently large unit cell and a polymer chain uh, running through it in the vertical direction. And uh, the idea is now to perform molecular dynamics calculation. And uh, so while we doing the calculation, we constantly increase the length of this uh, Z or C lattice vector. And uh, let me just show you the, um, the labels here. So we are constantly doing the MD simulation, tearing the system apart. And uh, so what's gonna happen is at some point, um, 
these uh, cis double bonds will convert into trans double bonds uh, because that uh, allows the system to accommodate for a longer unit cell. And if we pull this, so this will happen eventually one by one, sometimes multiple, and uh, flip at the same time. And eventually the whole thing will, the chain will snap. And uh, yeah, one then gets a, uh, basically a molecule in a periodic system. So what are we gonna do then is uh, we also monitor the components of the stress under this uh, external strain applied. And uh, yeah, at the end, we're gonna plot that and then we can uh, yeah, deduce mechanical properties from this plot. So um, to start with that, we switch to ReXFF. We pick one of the pre-selected force fields. In that case, that's just uh, the CHO.FF uh, selected on the force fields here. I will give it a sufficiently large number of iterations as this can uh, actually take quite a little bit. Um, I will we can abort the uh, simulation if we see that uh, the system has reached the final state. Um, we pick an MPT Berenson method for the molecular dynamics calculation. Um, our example here asks that we slightly increase the temperature to 300.15 Kelvin. We have a pressure of one, one or one bar and um, we then apply a damping constant for uh, this pressure at uh, 1500 femtoseconds. Um, so then we select here that we uh, monitor the stress energy. Also, uh, by the way, in the graphical user interface, there's always this help balloon uh, over the different option tabs, uh, yeah, which provides further information, uh, which uh, would intend to help the user. So uh, besides of the main tab, we can then switch to details and molecular dynamics because we have to uh, tell the system that it is not allowed to uh, change the C lattice vector according uh, to what it wants. And then we want to uh, have this under control. And um, we store the KF result file after every 2000 iterations. Um, then what we have to set as the last point is the volume regime. And uh, so we go on a model and the last point here is volume regime. We click on the plus to apply such or to add such a volume regime. Um, we say that we want to indeed change the cell parameter uh, of the C lattice vector and then we apply a changing rate of, um, what is that, 10 to the power of minus six times eight. And uh, yeah, this is in principle then already everything. So of course the strain rate needs to correspond to something physical. Um, however, for the present example, that's not really needed. So what we're gonna do is, um, uh, we're just gonna save this here. So as uh, polyacetylene strength, um, I'm gonna save this example and then fire up the calculation. Again, the ADF Jobs Manager window will pop up here. And as you then can see here in this example, uh, this calculation will run. It will run for a while. Um, we're gonna come back to it in a moment. Um, so what I, yeah, was talking about uh, before, um, let me come back to that while we run the calculation, is indeed that, um, yeah, ReXFS, as said before, is a highly empirical force fields. So what we, um, what this means is that there are different uh, parameter sets around. They were generated for specific types of systems. Um, we at SCM, we try to yeah, ship a large number of such parameter sets and also keep our parameter set library uh, up to date as much as possible. And uh, so yeah, you can see here, for example, a selection of the uh, pre-packed parameter sets on the force field. However, in many cases, uh, one actually yeah, would like to 
uh, generate a force field for some specific situations. And um, so this is a increasingly requested topic. Um, it turns in general out that, yeah, system things are not as easy. And um, however, um, yeah, we try to help our users as much as possible with that. And uh, so this is still to some extent also work in progress. However, we are trying to come up with more and more tools to uh, ease this process and to allow the users to indeed um, yeah, generate their own force fields for their specific uh, research requirements and research projects. Um, so I want to just to quickly point you to some uh, examples on our website, some tutorials which indeed um, yeah, give you a glimpse of uh, how should you indeed uh, yeah, establish such training sets, um, how should, uh, what should they consist of, how to split them properly uh, so that you get some training and some validation data sets, um, what should one take into account. So there's an example in Cobalt here. Um, however, uh, it also has to be stressed out that this is always a uh, somewhat bigger endeavor and uh, so there is no yeah, silver bullet solution for that and uh, indeed yeah so I see some people have already experience with that um, yeah so we are indeed trying to help with that but uh, it will remain always a bigger project uh, but there's already some material on our website uh, showing how this can be done with the uh, Amsterdam modeling suit based on a couple of examples. So for example, we have to, some tools to manage this training data. Um, in the near future, we are also, um, some of our colleagues are working on uh, yeah, finishing a complete library to uh, uh, do this whole training process as a, uh, yeah, say a, a sort of scripted workflow, uh, which should uh, help with things a little bit. And uh, the long-term plan is also to indeed link this up with uh, this training data manager in the graphical user interface uh, in the hope to yeah, simplify things. So um, if that is of interest for you, uh, then yeah, you're very uh, warmly invited to check these examples out. And uh, of course, we're also uh, then curious um, about your feedback, how are you doing uh, with uh, such projects and our software. Uh, so yeah, there is that. Um, in the meantime, we can come back at our calculation. So we can see that, um, yeah, so it's already in by a certain amount of steps. Uh, this is a small system, so this will run very quickly, as you can see there's several hundred uh, different uh, images of trajectory points per second. Um, and what we can also do then is indeed um, monitor the progress. And uh, in order to do that, uh, again, click on the SCM logo and then select the ADF movie tool. So this will indeed open a new GUI uh, module. And then uh, what we can do is basically, first of all, switch to perspective. We uh, enable a periodic view. And we uh, look at the lattice vectors. We can also um, show the labels. So there's something written from the other window. So uh, yeah, this basically shows my system. And uh, on the bottom here, there's a movie bar. And if I click on play movie, it will indeed um, yeah, replay the trajectory. And as you can see here, what happened already pretty quickly is that uh, there is actually some of these bonds. If you look, they, yeah, at around iteration 40,000. There were already quite a few which uh, converted from a cis into a trans configuration, as you can see here. So still some of the double bonds remain in trans uh, in a cis configuration. And uh, yeah, with 
increasing iteration of it yeah, following the trajectory, uh, this will continue. So that in itself is uh, yeah, nice to look at the movie. However, it doesn't tell you very much. Um, however, there's also the possibility in this, um, uh, in this tool to indeed um, look at uh, different quantities and their plots. So if I move this window out of the way, um, so this indeed shows different, uh, yeah, in that case, the total energy of the system as a plot here, uh, plotted against uh, the iteration count. As you can see here, uh, the energy first, um, so yeah, was obviously in a higher energy configuration. So it uh, moves down in energy pretty quickly uh, during the first couple of iterations. And then while we are increasing uh, the C vector of the unit cell, the energy of course increases because we strain the system more and more. And uh, yeah, here we can then indeed see this uh, sharp drop is the conversion into, uh, yeah, of some of the cis double bonds into trans double bonds. And that uh, of course lowers the energy consistently because we have previously strained the system. Again, the thing will repeat and uh, because yeah, the strain continues to be applied and uh, we just pass through a second transition, which can be seen here. So now our chain is uh, indeed, it consists fully of uh, trans-configured double bonds. And uh, yeah, of course the thing goes on and uh, the system gets strained more and more. Um, we can also, what we can do for example is uh, we can enable a loop of this movie. So it will be uh, start from the beginning every time. Um, yeah, so we can also see how the system moves, um, how it evolves over time. Um, interestingly, uh, yeah, you see a lot of vibration in a horizontal direction here. However, as the yeah, chain stiffens up, uh, that will, the amplitude will get smaller and smaller until the system either changes or then uh, after a while snaps entirely. Um, so yeah, while this continues uh, running, I can also show you maybe how, um, yeah, how to deal with, with polymers in the Amsterdam modeling suit. Uh, let me just point out that there is a, an actual dedicated tool to generate these parameters. Um, and um, yeah, so there's an example from, yeah, I see that it's best shown on the, so there's a polymer builder uh, shown here where you can set different uh, monomer elements and uh, linking points and uh, repetition factors of monomers, caps and all kinds of things. There is a, tutorial and that as well. Um, it's, um, yeah, it can be found here on the GUI overview tutorials. There's one on the polymer builder. So this allows you to yeah, basically create very complex uh, polymer-like chain. Um, still parts of this is work in progress. Um, what we can also do in order to generate a simple system as the one we are running is basically yeah, so you start with a molecular system. Um, you can basically yeah, select the carbon tool. I can draw uh, some, yeah, say, elemental components of this um, system and uh, which actually be like this. And what I can do then is I select these two bonds, I right click and pick double bond here. And then I can also add um, hydrogen atoms. Uh, I can also then click into yeah, the pre-optimization option. So then I have a um, yeah, small uh, DN molecule. And uh, what I can then do is indeed enable a 3D periodic model that of course needs to have um, yeah, some adjusted lattice vectors. In that case, they are definitely too small. 
also want my horizontal ones to be bigger, let's say 19. Um, then I can basically map my atoms back into the unit cell. Um, yeah, and you can see already um, what happens in such a case. This is not really what we wanted. What we would like to have instead is um, this whole system to be present in the original unit cell. So I type this here. Um, so yeah, we can see our molecule here. Um, I also would like to align it in the Z direction. Uh, I do this by selecting two bonds and then using align and the Z mm -hmm. axis. Um, that yeah, basically gives me this molecule uh, oriented the way I want it to. I can move it again into the middle of the unit cell here so that, one, that I have no problem later on. I will uh, yeah, then switch to the Z direction here. And um, so what my task is now, basically I want to create a chain which goes through the um, units are completely here. So the first thing we do is we delete this and this um, hydrogen atom. We make the Z vector of the units are much smaller, say something like 5.5 five, five, five angstrom as shown here. It helps then also to yeah, enable the periodic view once in a while. So as I can see here, I can select say these two atoms and this uh, shows me the bonding distance. So this is the bonding distance within the same unit cell and this is to the next nearest neighbor. Um, what I would like this to is of course be as long as the other double bonds. So we remember this number roughly. So 147.7. And uh, so while I have that, this is a nice trick I can do. I can basically just lower this number. Um, until I'm close to the value I uh, want to see here. So this uh, might be already pretty much the same ballpark here, actually a slightly over, um, yeah, probably around that. And uh, so what it can then do, uh, the problem is I would, if I would now, um, yeah, basically create a bond between the two, I can do this by selecting bonds and head bonds. Uh, yeah, what will happen, of course, it is creates a bond uh, on the same unit cell. It's not exactly what I want. Um, what I would like to have instead is, um, let me check how this do. It's slightly too big and actually slightly moved. Let's keep it this way. Um, so what I can do, I can basically pick my uh, whole molecule. I can move slightly, I can move it slightly down say that this missing bond is now entirely in the unit cell. What I then do is edit crystal map atoms to back into the unit cell. In that case, the graphical user interface already generated bond length bonds which are missing directly. And one ends up with a polymer chain which basically reaches through the unit cell. Um, so what I then do is I uh, use the tool to generate a supercell, which opens this dialog window here. I uh, set the number of repetitions. I would roughly land up with something, uh, yeah, of uh, 20 angstroms in length. So I roughly pick five different copies. They're generated like this. And then, uh, yeah, that is basically the start of this, uh, how to generate such a model. And uh, noteworthy that will be slightly compressed. So your example or your MD calculation will run slightly longer with that. Um, yeah, speaking of which, let's return to our movie. Um, as we can see here, this, uh, the energy of the system has been going up significantly. So of course, this, there will be some time, more and more time needed until the whole system is, is stretched enough, enough to snap at the end. Um, so then let me just explain you what to do when uh, the whole thing is finished. So this is a bit random and actually it's quite hard to predict when this will break. Um, at some point it is gonna happen. Um, so what one can do then is, uh, as shown on the slides, after this calculation is concluded, 
you can um, yeah, basically use this uh, small helper script, which is uh, delivered in the downloadable package here, and you can apply that to, uh, so it, uh, first of all, you have to start a uh, console or a terminal. This you can do by uh, clicking here on help and on terminal. Uh, so that's especially handy if you're working on Windows. In that case, I think it's called console. But the idea is the same. It will give you a uh, Linux-like uh, bash environment, which has all the current uh, environment variables set in order to run uh, ADF tools, uh, Amsterdam modeling suite tools from the uh, yeah, console. And with that, you can then indeed, uh, yeah, execute the script. Uh, note that uh, the Amsterdam modeling suite comes with its own version of Python. Uh, this can be invoked by uh, the common start Python. Uh, this again contains all the necessary environment variables in Python in order to run our uh, tools and scripts. So once we run that, um, this basically generates a, um, a CSV file. Uh, let me just quickly check. I should actually have a, uh, a running example from a previous calculation I did while preparing this. Um, let me just see if I can retrieve that quickly. Yeah, or what I can actually just do is um, so, um, um, what so there is a question. What is your force field for? How are you parameterizing the values? Um, if that was addressed to the previous, okay, yeah, I was assuming so. Yes, indeed, uh, force field fitting is a bigger topic and it requires a lot of effort in any case if it is done uh, properly. So, um, So what I basically get as um, output, if I do this, um, let me just quickly show you this. Uh, so it will generate a file called stress drain curve.csv. And this is a very long CSV file, um, which basically contains the different strains applied. So as you can see here, so these are the first three columns. Um, and as you can see here, the strains in X and Y direction, they do not change very much. However, the strain in Z direction is increasing and increasing. And accordingly, you see the diagonal elements of the stress tensor as the next three columns. And as you can see here, again, the first two columns do not change very much in value. They kind of oscillate around zero more or less while the stress in uh, Z direction is um, yeah, steadily increasing until the system undergoes a phase transition. So uh, that is our result. And basically what we can also then do, I think I uh, yeah, put the, the comment here. So can uh, basically our task is to, to plot the uh, sixth column in that file against the third column. Uh, we can, for example, do that with new plots. Uh, let me just look at the comment here. Let's do this. Uh, so I do stress strain curve uh, using these two columns. What I should then essentially get is, uh, so note this was a previous calculation, so the result will always look slightly different. Um, what do we see here is basically the different uh, configurations of our system. Uh, during the simulation. So the first one is uh, the all cis configuration, uh, which will then uh, one by one or eventually multiple ones then uh, 
be converted into uh, transconfigured double bonds until the system then essentially snaps. And then this becomes essentially a molecule which is floating freely inside the unit cell and thus there will, this will have no effect on the strain anymore whatsoever. So uh, this curve remains flat and constant. Um, yeah, so this is basically our results. Um, let me just come back to our running example to see uh, how we are there. Um, so yeah, this seems to be still going up here. Again, I can rescale say, my uh, energy curve here. Um, also, let me check at which iteration we are essentially running here on. Um, yeah, this is this one here. So yeah, we are in at almost 400,000 uh, iterations. Um, yeah, typically or oh, something did change here now. Um, let's see if this was the final snapping of the chain because then we can actually already uh, stop this example and we would be basically done. So yeah, as you can see here, um, are pretty nice that this are the uh, yeah, last few moments of the polymer chain. So uh, somewhere in between these two uh, map out iteration, maybe it snapped um, and will then yeah, kind of uh, coil up. And uh, let's watch the movie. Again, um, also you can move with the arrow keys, you can uh, move along individual frames. Um, so yeah, this will now basically uh, essentially run forever or until it reaches the end of the iteration limit. Um, there is nothing which will happen anymore because we're dealing essentially with uh, yeah, a periodic image of a molecular chain. Um, so let me close this window here and indeed, uh, yeah, kill this job because it has done enough for us. Um, uh, let me turn back to this console here. And um, so assuming this is the, uh, my calculation folder, let me come back to this one here and um, so what I can then indeed do is uh, the one I was doing yesterday, sorry. Um, Here, so what we can then do is we uh, need to find so we call start Python, we do syspa and we call the script, and then um, we apply that to our uh, rxkf file, which is the binary output file. So, once we have this, this basically generated a new uh, CSV file which has pretty much the same results as before. And uh, yeah, we can then again plot it as I showed already before and obtain the stress versus strain curve as shown in this example here. So yeah, this uh, concludes my contribution for this online tutorial. Um, yeah, I hope you have been able to uh, follow along with that. Otherwise, as I said, uh, the input structures are available as, as are the slides for this presentation. Um, so yeah, if there are any questions left. Um, yeah, so I think indeed uh, there is more and more requests for some uh, tutorials about uh, XFF fitting. I'm currently working on one. Uh, there will be so there will be more material coming up, uh, also on my website. And uh, yeah, so if there are no further questions on this, I would then uh, like to hand over uh, to Ole. 
And yeah, if you have further questions, then just feel free to ask them in the chat and I will try to answer them while Ole continues with his, uh, his part of the presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay. So do we, am, am I audible? Yes. Let me share my screen. So, yes, my name is Ole Carstensen. And in the next, uh, yeah, probably hour or so, I would like to walk you through two more ReactsFF uh, examples. So two more examples from the world of uh, reactive force fields, molecular dynamics. And uh, I would like to start with an example that is called a buckyball, a buckyball versus graphene. And uh, this tutorial, as well as the other tutorial, is based on one of our online tutorials. So if you just click the link on the first page, uh, you get to the online version of this tutorial, um, where in uh, much detail and full glory, you can uh, follow through the, the whole thing. So uh, we are now doing a, a version that is a bit more compacted, and uh, I will point out some features that are interesting for, um, say, more uh, realistic, more, more useful simulation, say. Because what we want to do now is uh, we want to take, uh, we want to create a graphene sheet, and then we want to shoot a buckyball against it and uh, see what happens. And uh, let's just start by creating the graphene sheet. Um, at the end of, of this um, little example here, it will not take us very long. Uh, I will say a few words as to where exactly um, this can come in handy for, say, more real-world-like examples. So we start by opening ADF jobs, then uh, go to uh, ADF input. We start a new input. And here we are. Then we go to um, Reax AMPS. That's the AMPS version of ReactsFF. And we start by creating a graphene sheet from graphite. So I just click on the magnifying glass and then I type the first letters of the compound I'm looking for. And if I'm lucky, um, then this compound is included in the compound database that is shipped with the AMPS suite. So uh, in this case, I have obviously tested that before and I know that the graphite is there. Uh, I just select it and I get the unit cell of uh, graphite. Now to generate um, graphene from this, basically we only want uh, one layer. Maybe briefly take a look at the periodic structure. Um, this is also what, what Thomas has shown. This is the periodic view. If you click on this, on this icon to the right here, we only want uh, uh, one layer in this unit cell. Now we just remove one and we remove the upper one. If I hold down the shift key, I can select multiple atoms at once. And I press delete once I selected them and have deleted the upper layer. Now, uh, the steps are also outlined on the slides. Um, the next step I want to do before filling in the, the parameters for the simulation is I would like to generate a supercell. And that I can do by clicking on uh, the edit menu, crystal generate supercell. Just need to look what I chose, which settings I chose here, uh, 2021. Put that on the diagonal and use the tab key to jump through these fields here. So that means that uh, one unit cell, um, once I click OK, will contain 
20 of these units shown here in the x direction and 20 in the y direction, um, but only one in the z direction. Okay. And here we have our graphene sheet. Okay, so next thing that we want to do is we want to add some space above the graphene sheet because that is where we want our buckyball to start and um, say uh, start its trajectory when we shoot it at the surface and this we can do by just going to the model panel um, on the rex arms panel here you go to model lattice and then we just chose um, i think I, I said 80 in the slides just briefly, uh, actually, I said 60. And um, let's throw the suggestion on the slides. And um, it's not really that crucial for the simulation. Um, important is that we have enough space uh, in the Z direction as to fit our buckyball in, into it inside. Good. So now that we have done this, we can start by filling in the settings into the ReXFF and the ReXARMS main panel. Um, first off, we choose a force field and a simulation method. The force field I choose is the force field called C.FF. Now, um, it, was, it was asked before in, in, in the previous talk how you choose the force field. And uh, it's not always um, that easy to choose the force field. In fact, um, we have some advice online on, on how to find a suitable force field in our frequently asked questions section. You find if you go to support. So which ReXFF force field should I use? And uh, some other related questions, but um, um, it's not, it's not say, um, straightforward uh, to say which force field you should use. In this case, um, it, it's a bit easier because what you usually do is you see if somebody has done a simulation on a system very similar or even ideally the same system that you want to study. And uh, then you have to, um, you select that force field, but you will still have to test it for the system at hand to see um, if, if it can describe your products, reactions, and uh, energetics. Good. So um, we chose a force field um, that was actually, as far as I remember, meant for, um, for uh, carbon-like systems, so uh, graphene sheets and, and nanotubes, I think. And uh, we chose the settings. Let's see. The method. Mm. Yes. Okay, so we can choose the let's see, molecular dynamics, radicity bulk. Uh, uh, okay, this NVE setting. We add a later, we just move on to the molecule gun as for now. And in the molecule gun panel, um, you just click on uh, add molecules. Then you um, click on system. And what we want to do is we want to add uh, region one. Then we click on the magnifying glass again and import a buckyball. That is also one of the compounds in the compound database. So I click OK and it will be inserted automatically. And it's also automatically highlighted. So it will be inserted and selected. And uh, you can use your right mouse button if you aim at one of the atoms 
to move the system around. Um, the positioning is not really essential for now, but uh, try to um, uh, put the buckyball somewhat um, somewhat as, as shown here, so not, not too close to the surface, just uh, uh, let's see what sort of distance I have here. Yeah, you can see it's like um, 1,200. That's the distance I have here. Put it in the, um, I would say, uh, lower third of, of the simulation box uh, with respect to the Z lattice vector. Uh, okay, now you, you can select, you select the buckyball. Again, holding shift key down, select all atoms. And then you can go to a system and a new region again. And, and now your buckyball should be um, surrounded by glowing spheres, indicating that uh, this atoms, these atoms that form the buckyball are in region two which is the region that, um, that defines the bullet in this molecule gun situ uh, simulation. Okay, so, um, yeah. Okay, so I'm uh, following the steps, not uh, very strict, uh, sorry about that. Um, but uh, it's, it's the same in the end, in order to run the simulation. Um, so um, the molecule gun settings, as I said, um, the, the bullet that will be shot is the buckyball that we have added to region two. Now we need to define a frequency at which this bullet will be shot at the surface. Um, that means um, we can, the frequency is given as, um, as per um, iterations. So if we if we um, if we request a frequency of of one, um, it it will um, as I said, if you hover your mouse over the um, over the tooltips, you will see it. Every every x steps, there will be a bullet added. And if we leave this at zero, there will uh, never be a bullet added. Um, we want this, um, this adding of bullets to start at the simulation step one, and we want it to stop at uh, simulation step. Um, so we do 8,000 steps in total. Um, let's say we, we only want to add it one time. Just put a large value here. And uh, I can just... Now we just do like this. So start at step one and then end at step step three or so. Um, then we can define um, a sigma value for coordinates in the coordinates box as to where the, um, the bullet starts. So we can have the bullet start at a random position above the surface. Um, at a constant distance to the surface, but random x, y coordinates or any other um, random position if we want. But um, what we're going to do in this example is we're going to define a vector at which the bullet hits the surface. And to do so, we select two atoms in the system. And this is outlined here. We select one. Uh, just one atom at the bottom of the buckyball and one atom in the system. And uh, these two atoms now define a vector for us. And this will be the vector along which the buckyball will be shot at the surface. So we just select these atoms and click on plus in velocity direction. As an initial velocity, we select uh, 0.05 angstrom per femtosecond. Um, again, uh, all these settings can be subject to, um, yeah, to a distribution function. So we can have a velocity distribution, a distribution of velocities that uh, comes in handy, of course, um, if we shoot more than just one time um, at the surface, but if we continuously shoot at the surface. 
And I think this should be the settings for the bullet. Now, if we run the simulations like this, then the impact of the buckyball onto the surface will, onto the graphene sheet, will shove the surface out of the periodic box. So let's just fix the graphene sheet in position, or at least roughly fix it. This we can do by clicking onto the model panel and going to geometry constraints. Now select one atom at, at every corner. Remember that this is a periodic system. And click plus in the panel and you can see that the positions of these two atoms are now held fixed. Now for the MD settings, we want to run 8,000 steps. We're going to leave it at a time step of 0.25 femtoseconds. Uh, sample frequency we can leave. And the initial velocities, yeah. We can set to zero. That means that we have a cold graphene sheet, but uh, yeah, we don't need to do this, but we are doing this for, for our first trial. And now we are ready to save and run the simulation. I'm just naming it to the molecule gun. And so I saved it now. And then we can run the calculation. You either select File Run uh, from the menu, or you hit Control R. And you can see there was already a log file entry in which it was stated that 60 atoms have been added to the simulation. Now let's have a look. So this is our super cold graphene sheet and a buckyball impacting it. Okay, so this uh, gets uh, pretty much destroyed. Um, I'm terminating the simulation by clicking on job kill. Now we can try to to run the simulation at different impact velocities. Say, no. point, point one action per femtosecond twice as fast. Save this and just run it again. So those of you who, um, I should mention, who maybe did not uh, manage to follow up, there is in the directory in the tar archive that you could download, um, there is an input file called buckyball shoot. Yeah, the question. Can you go the Yeah. Hold on. Uh, 
I'm not sure what's happening. But maybe it's, it's best to type the question. Wait. No, 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 wait. Uh, there was a participant who unmuted him. Hello? No, I don't know if there was a question. There was a okay. <laughs> participant who could unmute himself somehow, so I don't know what happened. So uh, please go on. Okay. Well, um, yeah, good. Sorry. So. Yeah, so uh, yeah, what I wanted wanted to say is um, that the simulation um, that we were running here, just see where uh, it's one here, I just kill it. Um, if you want to want to play around with the simulation setup and try some different settings, uh, you can as well just go to this zip archive that we have provided a download link for this uh, winter school reactive uh, mobile gun and battery and inside there if you unpack this um, you will find a, a directory that is called molecule gun and the input file of the simulation that we have just uh, uh, that we have just created now uh, is in there. So you can just load this one too if you want. This uh, stems from a previous run and just play around with the molecule gun settings. So an interesting setting for example would be to operate uh, the molecule gun continuously. That means to shoot several particles at the surface and uh, that also happens to be one of the applications, um, say for a more realistic um, simulation of, uh, say, of, of, of materials. Uh, you can use the molecule gun to simulate um, sputtering, for example. So if you have, uh, say, um, noble gas ions hit the surface at high velocities, you can do that with the molecule gun. You can do that continuously or with single shot. Um, experiments. As I said, you can start randomly above the surface and you can also vary the impact angle um, of the bullet. So this is uh, basically what all the ingredients you need to simulate uh, sputtering. Or you can study uh, deposition processes. That's also one option. So if you, if you have a surface and you want to study how compounds deposit on that surface, you can have continuously, um, say, rain down molecules onto, onto your surface also by operating the molecule gun in continuous mode. So this uh, very example I showed here, this is just a, yeah, again, a, a single shot toy system um, that makes for a, for a nice movie. And you will see the buckyball hit the surface, but uh, they say the real applications are more in the area of surface deposition and sputtering. And I can just click on the YouTube link if I'm allowed to. And i uh, show you real quick before we uh, move on. And um, this is a simulation that I did a couple of weeks ago and that shows such a uh, single shot sputtering experiment. So the red particle you can see here, um, that's an argon ion shot at one keV uh, kilo electron volt impact velocity at a uh, um, quartz surface. And you can see the sputtering reactions going on inside the material. And uh, for a simulation of, ex of the experiment, um, of the sputtering experiment, you will have to run many of such trajectories, but these are just a short simulation. This is just a couple um, of thousand time steps. The system is also not too big. So you um, can afford to run, say, 50 hundreds of trajectories and average the properties. Uh, yeah, you can count the atoms that get sputtered out. You can see um, what uh, secondary reactions occur, how far does the noble gas ion penetrate the system, and so on and so forth. All these things, um, all these properties are then readily available. Um, I should mention maybe that for these high impact simulations, so um, where you have a high impact velocity of the bullet, um, you will need to use a force field that uh, provides uh, what is called inner wall shieldings. So that is a, say, non-reflective hard inner potential energy wall um, between the atoms. 
because in these simulations in the force field atoms do not have a hard core. Um, they are usually repelled by electrostatics and if you have enough impact velocity you just fly right through. So you overcome the electrostatics and you just fly right through your material and this is something you obviously don't want when you want to study sputtering. So in this case you will need to have a force field that has these inner wall shieldings and if you don't have such a force field there's always the option to fit these parameters, which is what was also done uh, for this simulation. Good. So um, that was the molecule gun example. And the next example that I would like to show is um, from the area of battery research. And uh, I will show you how you can use ReXFF to simulate the discharge of a lithium sulfur battery, or say more precise to simulate the voltage profile and the volume expansion of the lithium sulfur battery. And uh, this is now used, uh, this is not done with uh, the help of uh, Grand Canonical Monte Carlo simulation. So this is not a standard MD simulation, but a Monte Carlo simulation. And again, um, this tutorial is based on an existing online tutorial where um, all the important links are gathered. So you just click on the link in the PDF and you get to here. Um, there will be a bit of theoretical background, some explanation, and uh, most importantly, there is also the link to the paper from where I took the workflow. Um, so this is a boiled down smaller version of the workflow that was um, published by the group of Adri Van Down. And uh, this is what we want to simulate, this little cartoon. So we have a sulfur, uh, alpha sulfur system, and we want to incorporate lithium ions into the system, which is exactly what happens when you discharge a lithium sulfur battery. And the way we are going to simulate this is by means of Grand Canonical Monte Carlo. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to get ourselves a crystal structure of sulfur, of uh, alpha sulfur actually. And uh, there's a couple of online resources where you can get these. Um, I put a link here too. Um, this uh, will redirect you to our website, but the structure is also in the directory of the TAR archive that you've downloaded called GCMC. And the first directory, subdirectory that we go to into will be uh, sulfur optimization. And this s underscore eight underscore alpha, um, this is a CIF file of the crystal structure. And uh, to import this into ADF input, um, a nice way to import these structures into ADF input is to just open them and then select the content of the whole file. You can do that by hitting Control R. Now everything inside the file gets selected. Control C or right click. I'm on a Windows computer here. Right click, copy. Let me just start a fresh ADF input for this part of the tutorial. Just a molecule gun. And then you can just click into, so I'm clicking one time into this molecule view panel here. And then I click control V and the structure was automatically imported into the graphical user interface. You can, of course, also just open the .adf file that I put into that directory. That also works. But I think this copy and paste mechanism is quite handy, especially if, you, if you're looking for some crystal structures, you usually find them online in some uh, crystal, crystal, crystallography database, and you just copy them and paste them into the graphical user interface directly. I think that's quite a convenient way. So no need to download any SIF files. Uh, it works nicely like this. 
Okay, so um, once we have this surface structure now, the first thing we want to do is we want to optimize the structure because we want this to be a relaxed structure also with respect to the lattice vectors and the force field we are using. Now in this case, choosing the force field is, uh, is most simple because we just picked the same force field that was used in the publication from which we took the, from where we took the workflow. Okay, so lithium sulfur dot FF it is. Uh, the task is gonna be uh, geometry optimization. And uh, as I mentioned, we do want to optimize the lattice vectors as well. So, uh, going back to the main panel, geometry optimization, you see these arrows here in um, the control panels. If you click on those, they will um, direct you to where you can specify details of um, the task in this case. Um, we can leave everything at the default, but we want to tick the box where it says optimize lattice. Now that's all we had to do. We save the file. As just want to run it in the in the same directory. I need a bit of a different name. I'm calling it alpha. Saving it, and now I'm running it. And when asked if I want to update the structure, I say yes. And you can see that there was not so much change, but uh, yeah, that, that, that went smooth. So that's the optimized structure. If we want to see the, the progress of the geometry optimization, we can uh, open ADF movie and uh, we see some of the properties and you can see that this took a bit more than 200 iterations, which uh, I think is a fairly, fairly fast and uh, efficient optimization here of this structure since yeah, the lattice vectors were included. Good. So um, now we have optimized our cipher structure, which will be the structure that we want, uh, say our cathode material in which we want to incorporate the lithium ions that has been optimized. And uh, what we want to do next is calculate the chemical potential for lithium. And uh, this is something that we need to provide to the Monte Carlo algorithm, which in a nutshell, um, compares the energy gain you get by inserting an ion into the sulfur structure versus the energy you need to remove one lithium from a bulk lithium structure. So in order for us to compare these two values, we need to calculate the energy, um, yeah, what is written here as uh, the energy of uh, needed to remove one lithium from the bike structure, which then will be our uh, chemical potential of the lithium in the simulation. Again, um, in the tutorial, there's a bit more background on, on how this um, works in terms of theory, and there will be even more background in the publication. But I keep it short here. Um, what we want to do to um, obtain this chemical potential is we want to generate bulk lithium structure first. And this we can do by just selecting the lithium preset uh, found under edit crystal cubic BCC. We'll open a new input file for this. The cubic BCC. And then I will just choose the lithium preset and click OK. Here we go. Uh, we want to select Rex Arms as the engine. Sorry. I wanted to 
show this. And to generate our bulk structure, we are going to do um, 8 by 8 by 8 supercell. Now we've done a supercell before, but uh, that was to generate the graphene sheet. And um, this time we um, generate a supercell in all three uh, lattice directions. Edit, crystal, generate supercell. And then on the diagonal, we just put eight. There we go, that's our bulk lithium structure. That is also, of course, a periodic structure, which you can see if you click on the repeat unit cells button here, just to give you an idea. Turn it off again. Now, this structure we want to optimize in exactly the same way as we optimized our uh, sulfur. We will select as the task, we select geometry optimization and the force field. Um, we are going to use lithium sulfur.ff. Then we jump into the options for the geometry optimization again by following this arrow button. And under optimize lattice, we tick yes. <coughs> and that was about everything we needed to do. Now we save this. I will just call it lithium. Again, if you if you couldn't follow, um, because I did too fast, you can just open the according input file in the subdirectory. I just saved it. Now I run it, and this time uh, I'm just going to hit Control R. This is the shortcut for running a simulation. It's very convenient, and the calculation has converged already. Now, the property we are interested in can be found by clicking on this SCM menu here, or the icon if you're not on Windows. Then open the output module and scroll to the end. This is um, the atoms in the system. And you will see um, calculation results, the energy given in Hartree. And you can also, if you scroll down, you will see that the system contained 512 atoms. So with this knowledge, we can just compute the chemical potential for our grand canonical Monte Carlo simulation by um, yeah, taking the total energy of the optimized bulk structure divided by the number of lithium atoms in, in this uh, in the unit cell. Um, and that yields uh, 0 0.06 something atomic units or in kcal per mole minus 37.7. Now we have all the ingredients that we need to set up our grand canonical Monte Carlo simulation. Close this. And just open a fresh PDF input. Yeah, so um, we want to use our previously optimized sulfur structure. So there's several ways uh, we, can, we can get that structure now. Probably the easiest is to just go click on the file menu and then open the calculation. And I will be asked if I want to update this structure with the optimized structure that was run before, and I will say yes. Um, 
Another way could be to just export the Cartesian coordinates from ADF movie. I showed you the, the movie of the geometry optimization. And yeah, you could just save the last frame. Uh, file, save, uh, export coordinates, I think it's called. And then you could just export the last frame and then you have the XYZ coordinates of your optimized structure. That would also be a way to do it. Um, now this simulation we are going to save first because otherwise we overwrite our sulfur.adf file. Just click on file, save as. GCMC directory and I'm going to name it GCMC. It already exists, okay. Call it GCMC underscore demo. That's not really so important. Okay, so um, we have our nice sulfur structure here, and now we just have to set up the GCMC calculation. Um, you can select this as a task from the task drop down menu and click on the arrow button to go to the GCMC settings panel. And in the GCMC settings panel, we are going to select an ensemble that we want to equilibrate. And in our case, that will be mu PT. So that means that we are trying, um, trying to optimize an ensemble with a constant temperature, constant pressure, and constant chemical potential. And the grand canonical ensemble um, will be uh, so the grand canonical uh, Monte Carlo will try to reach an ensemble that is in a thermodynamic equilibrium. So that's why the chemical potential will have to be uh, have to be constant. Obviously, the, um, the pressure you want to have constant because you want to allow your unit cell to expand. And this ensemble here, the uh, mu vt, that can also be chosen. Um, that will not allow the system to expand. And um, trust me, it will expand significantly. So we want to keep the pressure constant, not the volume. The number of iterations, we choose 1000. Uh, this value is usually not known beforehand, but uh, in this case, it, it will be sufficient to uh, fully elicitate uh, the cathode. And the other values we keep at the default and then we put add molecules within six angstrom and add molecules not closer than 1.2 angstrom. So these two values are quite important because um, what this algorithm will now do is, um, I will briefly mention that it will compare the energy that um, this system reaches once you insert a lithium atom into it um, against the energy um, of yeah, the chemical potential of the lithium. There's uh, one lithium atom from, from the bulk lithium uh, removed from the, from the bulk. And uh, the three Monte Carlo moves that are carried out is you either insert a lithium atom into the system, uh, you move a uh, lithium atom that is already in the system, you just move it to a different spot or you remove it from the system. And uh, this will then at some point um, characterize equilibrium um, if you start, um, say, adding as much as you remove, and then this will be equilibrated. And uh, in order for this um, grand canonical Monte Carlo to make a um, educated guess as to where to put the lithium atom, you have to provide some, some boundaries because you do not want the algorithm to just naively uh, generate nuclear fusion by placing a lithium at atom exactly on top of uh, an existing atom or say um, placing it so close um, that you got uh, severe repulsion terms and that the, the force field just uh, blows up and explodes. So this is what these two values mean. You want to be within a reasonable distance of the other atoms, that's the six angstrom, but you don't want to be closer to any other atom than 1.2 angstrom. And uh, that's uh, quite a good guess. There are some rules of thumbs in the tutorial as to uh, how to choose these values if you are facing the challenge to run the simulation with a completely different system. 
Um, there's some rules of thumb that, that we came up with that usually work quite well. Okay. Um, as far as I can see, these uh, basic settings of the GCMC algorithm are done. And now what we have to do is we have to define the molecule that should be inserted. And that would be a single lithium atom. So I just click on the plus button here next to molecules and that will open a small drop down menu. And uh, on the drop down menu molecule, I select new molecule. You might think, where's my, my surface structure gone? Actually, we have two windows now in the molecule view panel. And the one being the system and the other one being the species that will be added to the system. Now we select a lithium atom here. Yes. And it doesn't really matter where it is located, but uh, say for cosmetic reasons, we can just briefly map it into, into the middle of the unit cells. What I did was I went to edit, crystal, set 0.5.5.5. So that's our single lithium atom. And now all we need to do is provide a chemical potential for the grand canonical Monte Carlo algorithm. And we will provide the value in kcal per mole, which is the same one that uh, is the standard units for, for ReXFF. You can use atomic units if you want, but uh, I'm going to use kcal per mole. And before you enter kcal, you have to select kcal per mole from the units menu. So again, you can click on these. Units menu, select a cal per mole and then 37.7, which is the value we have calculated before. Yes, and also for cosmetic reasons, we can briefly rename these two panels here. So I will rename this to lithium and the sulfur one to system just to make things extra extra clear and that was about it now we can start the calculation save the file save us we saved it as gcmc demo yes i do want to replace that and then we again use the keyboard shortcut control R to run the calculation. Now this calculation will run for, it depends a bit on, on your compute resources. So I'm, I'm using a, a small normal laptop here. So the whole simulation will probably run for a bit less than an hour. So typically say uh, 30, 40, 50 minutes, something like that. But we can already uh, gain some nice insights into the simulation without having finished the actual simulation. So now just uh, select from the STM menu, select ADF movie. And first thing we can do is just play the movie. And what you can see is that in order for this system to reach chemical a uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, sorry, uh, which is the goal of the grand canonical Monte Carlo algorithm. Um, lithium atoms get um, incorporated into this sulfur structure. And this happens at a high rate in the beginning, and then it will start to slow down a bit. But uh, for now, it's, it's uh, still happening. I think every, every move you can see here, every accepted Monte Carlo move is the insertion of uh, lithium ion. Um, remember there were there are two, uh, three Monte Carlo moves, um, namely inserting an atom, moving an atom around and removing an atom. 
And uh, removing an atom obviously is uh, not favored at, at this point. Uh, it will be later when, when the battery is uh, fully discharged. Now, the second thing we can have a look at is the volume of the cell. And this value is available if you select uh, graph. Let me go down a bit, cell volume. Now, um, you can see that this cell is expanding. Uh -huh. Okay, there's a question I just see. We just leave this running and, uh, and we note that the cell is expanding. It will expand further, but we can look at this a bit later. Let me just bring up the chat so I can see the question. Where is it? Mm -hmm. Ah, no, here it is. Ah, okay. Should I read it for you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I found it. Uh, you see it? Chat. Uh -huh. It's about chemical. Okay, yeah, okay, okay. I, I got it. Sorry, I, I was hiding the chat for myself and I had to retrieve it real quick. Uh, is there another way to calculate the chemical potential of the atoms? CO2 absorption on a periodic structure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's actually a different, that's a different uh, situation um, because I don't assume that you have a CO2 solid uh, considered as the external system. So you cannot really say I have a, I have solid CO2 and I, I want to, uh, I want to extract them. You know, you cannot apply the same logic as you do in this simulation. And there are other ways to calculate the chemical potential and uh, for, for gas phase species, there's also, um, actually there are some, there are some approximations that are not applying then really anymore in your case, especially towards the end. Yeah, so you have to consider enthalpic and entropic contributions as well. Um, yeah, so I think you have you have to um, you have to apply thermodynamics to thermodynamic arguments to to calculate your CO two potential, uh, chemical potential. Sorry. Well done. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, sorry, um, I, I couldn't just uh, sort of uh, give you give you uh, clearance to just use this very same workflow. It's it's going to be a bit different, but I'm I'm sure you you um, you will be able to find uh, literature values on this. I mean, it's quite a quite a typical case to to study absorption on 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 periodic structures or in pores, say using this uh, grand canonical Monte Carlo. So I'm I'm sure there will be a lot of literature out there. Um, otherwise, um, you could also um, ask the question on our support. And it could be that, that we have uh, Yeah, well, if, if you find a suitable publication, yes. But you can also uh, drop us a message at, at support at scm.com. Um, that's here. And then uh, we, we, can, we can see if uh, maybe we have some uh, ReactsFF compatible like, literature on, on this particular topic. But, but it really depends um, what, what experimental setup you, you want to simulate. Good. Um, so back to the back to ADF. We can see um, we are just following down the path of uh, initiating this this cathode material completely. Um, 
say the, the complete lithiation would that be a lithium 2s. So having two lithium atoms per sulfur atom. Uh, but you can already see that uh, the volume expansion is significant. And in the end, until fully discharged, we're going to expand in volume by roughly a factor of two. Um, this is obviously uh, one, one of the challenges in this battery materials to somehow yeah, control this uh, massive volume expansion. And uh, we can nicely reproduce this with uh, ReXFF as well. So that's, that's the one uh, um, experimental finding we can reproduce, but we can also calculate the discharge voltage curve. And in order to do that, I'm just going to terminate the calculation. Uh, it's not done yet, but uh, it, it went far enough for now. And I'm opening a terminal. I uh, click on help and command line. And Thomas has already pointed out that this is the, the best way to open a command line. Because this one, oh, uh, it, it's not, I just increase the font a bit for you so you can see what I'm typing. Window a bit smaller. And this, all, all these things you're reading here on top, um, this is the environment variables that you would need to set up yourself if you would not be using this uh, pre-configured shell. Um, so that, that, that's uh, a strong argument, uh, say, to use the, from the help menu up the command line on Windows or terminal on Mac. If you're on a Linux computer, you can just use um, the standard uh, shell that you have. If you have installed um, ARMS correctly, you should actually have sourced all the um, command line variables um, already. So now um, we need to run a bit of a Python code, analysis code, and that's a small script that was written with our in-house uh, Python library called Plums. And uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, custom trajectory analysis, or generating their own workflows for that matter. Um, this script um, is a really good read. So um, that's a very sound and very, um, very compact as well, a very compact analysis script that uh, walks you through some of the main steps you need to take in order to read and analyze ReXFF trajectories. So yeah, it's a, it's a suggested read, very nicely commented. Um, so we just need to download this little script. Um, yeah, there's a download link here, but it's also already, if you are working in the directory of the tar archive I provided, then the script should already be there. It's called a uh, lithium voltage profile uh, without any spaces dot pi. So it's Python code. And you can also see here as well in the PDF file, uh, what is the command that we need to execute. Now, the first thing that we should do is we should type in dash into the command line because that will provide us with a mini Linux-like uh, shell environment. Uh, so you can use ls uh, just like you would on a Linux command line is quite convenient. And a few other of the command line tools uh, of the Linux shell are available as well. It's not, uh, not all of them are, but uh, I think most of the basic ones are available. And then we need to execute the script. The script you can see here. So we are already in the correct uh, directory. Um, if you don't see the script, then you should move it as to where the calculation is running. Um, you have saved your input file somewhere and then you are executing the calculation somewhere and that's where the .adf file is located. This is where the script should be as well. Good. Now all we need to do is uh, call plums. So we don't call a Python interpreter directly, even though we of course ship a Python interpreter as well. Uh, plums has also an interpreter. 
uh, for this script that already has uh, imported all the relevant libraries that you need for, uh, for a Plum script to run properly. So Plums it is, then the name of the script we want to execute, lithium voltage profile.py, and then minus V results dear equals half to the dot results for results here equals and half to the dot results folder and there is not much path here the results folder is exactly here where we are so i'm just providing a name to that folder and then i hit enter and that should hopefully work now and there you go. So in this case, um, the script is just writing the results to, um, to the command line, um, but you can use just standard file redirect, uh, IO redirect to redirect this output into a file and then use your favorite plotting program to plot the results. So uh, yeah, like Thomas showed that you can use GNU plot now, uh, I don't really have any plotting software on this Windows machine, but if you would, if I would, I would plot the number of lithium atoms or uh, even better, the fraction of lithium atoms against the voltage in volt. So that would be the second column against the third. And if I'm interested in the volume change of the battery, I would plot the second uh, for, uh, column against the fourth. And that would then look like this. So this is what it will look like if you finish the calculation. So the fraction is uh, what is shown here on the x-axis. So that's the amount of lithium per 128 atoms we have in our sulfur cell. Lithium per sulfur, basically the ratio between these two. And uh, as I said, uh, fully discharge will lead us to a structure lithium to sulfur and uh, then the battery is discharged. So this is what comes out of this calculations once you have uh, finished it. And on the right here, you can see a comparison with uh, an experimental curve. So um, this number one, uh, this is taken from the publication. So I'm sorry for not putting the reference in here. I just see I have the experimental curve with the reference can be found in the initial publication, the link you get in the online tutorial. And um, those of you interested in uh, uh, battery simulation with VXFF, uh, this is a really nice read. It's a very nice paper and uh, this is just one um, interesting workflow of many, many, many workflows that are all bundled in this one very comprehensive paper. And with this, I think uh, we have finished the two ReactsFF tutorials I had planned for you. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank really. you very much. The questions are a bit behind. But, uh, it's maybe because people are typing. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we we are actually we have maybe, maybe we can read a question because oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Recording. So, what but... about the charge phenomenon? Yes, so what, what about the other direction? How, how do you charge a battery? Um, we, have not, we have not made a tutorial on this. It's also not included in the paper, but in principle, hey, you, you're very welcome, Talia. But uh, yeah, so uh, as for the, for the charge of the, of the battery, um, you can in principle apply a very similar logic to study the charge of the system. Um, except for yeah, you want to you want to remove lithium atoms, 
Um, so you, you would not um, want to incorporate more lithium atoms into what is already bulk lithium, but you want to remove them from the system. But the functionality is there. So it's possible to um, tell um, the GCMC algorithm that all these atoms have been added to the system and uh, now we need to remove them. Um, you will have to choose a different chemical potential. Um, yeah, as I said, we, we, we thought about this, but we haven't thought about this too hard, but it has been a request. And uh, if we find the time, we might actually extend uh, the online tutorial to also include the charge. Should be possible. And it's on the list, but uh, we haven't done it yet. Uh, yeah, very interesting indeed, yeah. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Someone is pointing out, Talia is pointing out that she has no further questions, but thank you for an excellent presentation. <laughs> yes, indeed, thank you. It, thank you all for your time. Ole, Thomas, Fedor, it was a really interesting day today. Uh, thank you for organizing this. <laughs> really <laughs> lovely event. <laughs> thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Okay, another question is coming in. For an MD simulation in Reacts FF, how much time would be sensible to run it for? Yeah, it depends, I would say. Um, in principle, um, when you run MD simulations, and we're now talking classical MD simulations, you are sampling, um, you want to generate an ensemble. So you're sampling something. And um, say, if you request that your ensemble has, uh, for example, say constant temperature, then you have to at least run so long until the temperature has been equilibrated. You can see the temperature, you can visualize an ADF movie. So if the temperature is not equilibrated yet, the, the, the whole trajectory is not equilibrated. And then once the temperature has been equilibrated, you want to sample to calculate your properties out of the system. So that comes then on top. And uh, yeah, there has people who run uh, MD calculations for, for days, weeks, it depends. 10,000 atoms on four cores. Yeah, that's quite long, three weeks, 10,000 atoms, yeah. Um, there might be, yeah, maybe, I mean, I mean um, that if four cores is, I would say, uh, quite, quite little for such, a, for such a big simulation. It's not really super huge, but if you can get your hands on a, on a machine that has a bit more cost, then uh, I think you can expect quite a significant speed up. Yeah. So maybe we could read your questions. Uh, so uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> no, no. So um, the question is now um, about, about typical um, typical uh, time needed for, for uh, MD simulations. And there was one note here from Talia saying that uh, she has, her system contains 10,000 atoms. And if she runs that on four cores, it can take up to three weeks. And uh, Phoebe, um, if I pronounce that correctly, um, is running a system with about 3,000 atoms. And she was wondering how many cores she should use. So um, in, in, the, in the first case, 10,000 atoms and four cores, you can definitely use more cores for that. Uh, so you can expect a significant speed up if you use uh, more cores. Um, as for the second case, 3,000 atoms is not that much. So you might want to test this a bit. Um, the thing is, if you just use too many cores, then the overhead that, that is required to have all these parallel runs and talk to each other, and then that will slow down your simulation. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a matter of cost, obviously. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think there might be a cloud option becoming available. Um, I'm, I don't know all too much about this, but when, if we are in touch, um, I mean, you know, the support at stm.com or, or Fedor's contact, maybe a cloud solution could be something then you can buy on demand. If you need compute power, you get compute power. If not, then not. Um, that could be interesting. But um, 
Yeah, so 3,000 atoms was the question. Um, what I would do is um, if you have access to a, a multiple cores, then I would try um, to start off with something, and I'm guessing now, uh, yeah, you can try four cores maybe, and uh, try on one core, and then you will see if it gets, uh, if, if you get any speed up or not. I mean, you don't need to run the full thing, you just run a couple of, I don't know, uh, a couple of hundred femtoseconds, and then you compare, and then you see. Uh, that's basically what I would do. But I think 3,000 atoms, you, you, might, you might get a bit of speed up if, if you use more than one core, but yeah. But such, um, I mean, um, if you want to know for sure, um, then I can also, if you write to support it at um, then we can also bring in our parallelization experts who, has, uh, who are in uh, charge of writing the parallel code. They might know more about this. I would just naively start by, by trying a few settings and see if I get a noticeable speed up or not, if you have the license for multiple cores, of course that is. Okay, there is a license error. Yes, but maybe we can take them outside this scientific uh, meeting, the license yeah. questions. But there was a follow-up by Phoebe. She is telling that she did uh, 1.2 nanoseconds, but uh, that they have mentioned it's not enough. Yeah, it depends. Um, uh, it depends indeed uh, on, the, on the quantity that you want to simulate. Um, yeah, what, so what, what you want to sample, say. Uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with your, with your research, so I'm, I'm not sure. But if, for example, you want to sample conformations in a, in a larger molecule and you're running a low temperature simulation, then um, you will have to uh, sample for a very, very long time. Sometimes that time frame can also easily be outside the accessible timeframes that are at all possible. It, it can happen that you would need to simulate for, I don't know, 100 years or so. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the problem at hand. You want to, you, you have to know what you want to, what you want to sample, and then you have to um, either be able to observe this, saying, for example, an equilibrated temperature or an equilibrated pressure or in the term of the Monte Carlo simulation, um, yeah, you either have it lithiated all to the end, and uh, ideally you will want to see equilibrium reaching that there will be atoms removed from the system and added at the same rate. That would be equilibrium then. So that's the idea, but uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to say beforehand. Um, usually, um, from my experience, if you try to equilibrate multiple properties at once, say if you try to equilibrate a temperature and a pressure at the same time, it takes longer. It's, um, it can be that 1.2 nanoseconds is not enough, but it can also be enough. It depends on what exactly it is um, that, you, that you want to simulate. You know, you want good statistics. So you want to, first in the, in the RMD simulation, you want to equilibrate your temperature, you want to equilibrate your pressure, and then the production run starts. So then you sample your system and then as much you sample for as long as you need to get good statistics. Okay, thank you. Are there any more uh, questions for this session? There's a question for you, I think. Any participants? Yeah, just a participant on certificate. I was reading it, but I will I will discuss that later after we finished uh, that session. Uh, here, umbrella sampling is possible here. Is that, uh... I think I think actually it is. Um, I think we have. Um, uh, let me think real quick. Um, we we provide a link um, to this. Um, I'm just missing the name right now. This umbrella sampling library that everybody is using. Maybe somebody in the chat knows the one that everybody uses. I'm just not getting the name right now. We have an interface to that. You know, Thomas. Hold on. I see if I can find it. 
No. Uh, Someone is mentioning Umber? Uh, no. Uh, Meta dynamics. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, I don't that I don't have the name. Let's see if I can find it somewhere. Uh, Tomash is working on this, my colleague. I, I know who works on it, but. <laughs> Uh, uh, um. Ah, Plumet, I think. I think we have an interface to that. Let's see. Yeah, Plex MD indeed has a Plumet interface. So I think we have an interface to Plumet, and uh, that's that's how we we call it here in the Netherlands. Maybe that's uh, the English call it different. <laughs> and uh, that that uh, features a vast variety of meta dynamics, umbrella sampling, and so on and so forth. I think you can. Uh, so the answer to that would be to say uh, that you can use ReactFF in combination with these. Ah, perfect. Thank you, Phoebe. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a link in the chat now, uh, if you're interested. Yes, it's a link to Plumet and uh, it comes yeah. from the SEM website. Yeah, indeed. And uh, that's a third party library we're shipping. And uh, yeah. Uh, we, my uh, colleague Tomas, so not Thomas who is sitting next to me, but Tomas is an expert in, in meta dynamics and uh, acceleration methods. So he knows a lot about about this interface and and uh, how to use it. But that should be possible indeed. <laughs> 